Thank you for coming. I'm Jill McDonough. I'm an Athenaeum member, and I'm here to introduce Stuart Onan. Chosen by Granta as one of the best young American novelists in 1996, Stuart Onan is actually still young chronologically, although I imagine the burden of being a National Book Awards judge last year may have aged him prematurely. His own books include Snow Angels, The Names of the Dead, The Speed Queen, A Prayer for the Dying, Everyday People, and a collection of short stories in the Walled City. He's here tonight to read from his new book, The Good Wife. At www.stuart-onan.com, you lose the apostrophe on Onan, which may provide for some surprising Google results. But you gain a very clever timeline of his life, how I became a writer when I used to be an engineer. It includes influences ranging from cartoons and Velvet Underground to death certificates and structural test engineering. He has been praised by the New York Times Book Review, Stephen King, Publishers Weekly, and me. Please join me in welcoming Stuart O'Neill. Thank you. I, I wish they'd get rid of that young thing. I, I'm just no, I'm just not young anymore. But thank you. It's a, a pleasure to be here with the Red Sox one and two so far. Much better than zero and three. Could have heard. Uh, I'm going to read from my new book, The Good Wife. It's what I like to call a pastoral novel, in that my wife likes to say it's boring. Um, <laughs> it's slow. Uh, usually I'll write a novel that is very strange and technically very challenging in a formal way. Um, and then I'll counter that by writing something that I think is, is more pure or truthful. Um, and quiet and true to life. So this is, this is my small, boring book. Um, there's another book called Wish You Were Here that my wife dubbed the big, boring book. Uh, the big, boring book, when I wrote it, I said to myself, 80% of the readers that pick this book up will not finish it. And that's okay by me. Um, my agent did not like that attitude. Um, neither did my editor. I got, I got dumped from the publishing company. And I think after this book, I may get dumped from my new publisher. But that's OK, because I think I said what I really meant to say, which I think is the hardest thing to do in writing. And sometimes when you finish a book, you, you don't do that. You fail to do that. And in this book, I think I did it OK. So I'm going to read a few pieces from the beginning. Originally, the book was prefaced, or, or the sections of the book were prefaced by quotes from the Fleetwood Mac song, The Chain. Um, Fleetwood Mac would not give me the permissions for the chain. Um, so it's now prefaced by a different Fleetwood Mac song that I did not have to pay for. Um, and that is the landslide. And if you see my reflection in the snow-covered hills, the landslide will bring it down. This is from a section called Arrested. And from a segment called The Other Side of Midnight. Patty's asleep when it begins waiting for him in the dark. She goes to Tommy's game to see him play. He scores his first goal of the season, but she's pregnant and can't drink, so there's no reason for her to go out with the rest of the team after. She's tired, her back hurts from work and sitting on the hard bleachers, and she uses that as an excuse. It's why she brought her car in the first place. She teases him in the parking lot, saying she might have a surprise for him when he gets home. Be good she says, and kisses him, the ends of his wet hair needling her cheek. It's freezing in the dart, the steering wheel burning through her gloves. The defrost doesn't work, and all the way home she swipes at the windshield, tries to breathe lightly. Farms sail by in the night, the snowy fields ghostly, chore light showing a corner of a barn door, a skeletal gas pump. The muddy ruts of the drive crumble under her tires, hard as chocolate. When she slides into bed, the sheets are chilly on her skin. The waterbed is huge and new, the one real piece of furniture they own. She lies propped in the middle, reading The Other Side of Midnight, a novel her mother has already declared trash. Instead of her flannel nightshirt, she's wearing a sheer black peignoir that shows off her impressive new breasts. 
She's brushed her hair out the way Tommy likes it, the strawberry blonde fan setting off her freckles. She reads with her mouth slightly open, showing the pointed canines he calls her fangs. She could almost pass for a sexy vampire, except she's wearing the gold-framed Ben Franklin she's had since high school, very Jan Brady. In the book, two of the characters are fucking in a cramped airplane bathroom, something Patty, who's never been on a plane, finds impossibly glamorous and unlikely, but which makes her even hornier. It's been a while. The truest test of love, she's always thought, is making love. And while Tommy still comes to her now, he's too careful, too quiet. She misses their first crazy days together when he'd come out of the bathroom naked and walking on his hands, as if daring her to knock him over or pin him against a wall. She figures he'll be late. They'll close the Iroquois and he'll come in humming, bumping into things. She waits for the chug of his truck, the swish of the storm door, the shock of his hands on her, waits, warming, resting her eyes now, the book still propped on her stomach, until she slips all the way under, splayed beneath the heavy comforter. For a while, the other side of midnight lies tented on her chest, then capsizes, her place lost, the Kleenex bookmark somewhere in the tangle of covers. She's snoring, a rhythmic click in her sinuses, and then a long brain draw that would embarrass her if she knew. The night lawnet is on in the bathroom, glazing the sink. In the kitchen, the faucet drips into a sponge. She has no idea that as, as she sleeps, he's in another woman's bedroom, that a few miles across the fields, he and his best friend Gary are fighting with this woman, who's woken from her own solitary sleep and attacked them with the first thing at hand, a glass of water. The phone sits on the floor by his side of the bed, alive inside its shell. Outside, the winter sky turns, Orion winking in the clear night air, a hunter's moon sculpting the drifts. Here, before it all begins, there's still time. Time revolving along with the temperature on the display outside the Tioga State Bank in town. Time ticking in the gears behind the lit face of the county courthouse bell tower, quaint as a Christmas card. Time circling like the sweeping red second hand of the dashboard clock in his truck, hidden in the turnaround down by Owl Creek. Until now, until this phone rings, she's been happy, grateful to have him and a place of their own. Their marriage, her first improbably successful campaign against her mother, is everything she's wished for. And while her mother still considers him wild, with Casey on the way, that topic's off limits. Now all her mother can complain about is Eileen living with her no-good boyfriend and Shannon not visiting. By default, Patty's the favorite again. She's the one their mother calls when she needs someone to bring extra chairs or make dessert, someone to drive her to the doctor. Except for marrying Tommy, She's reliable. Miles away, the glass is broken on the carpet, the front of Tommy's shirt wet, though he doesn't notice. The phone, no, not yet. It's her bladder that wakes her. She mutters, surprised at the brightness. She gives up on her bookmark, sets the paperback on the headboard and clicks off the light. Her bottom sinks into the soft waterbed as she swings her legs free and levers herself out, pushing off the frame to lift her own weight. She's never been so ungainly, ugly, she thinks, and his stabs at reassuring her only make it worse. She doesn't turn on the light in the bathroom, just sits in the warm yellow glow, head bent, one elbow resting on the cool sink. When she pads back to bed, she could trip over the phone, kick it open so the call will never come. But she doesn't. She goes all the way around as if it would be a jinx to get in on his side. She lights the vanilla candle on the headboard, the flame doubled in the built-in mirror, then adjusts her peignoir and the covers to her advantage. But in a minute, she's sleeping again, snoring. In the house on Blodgett Road, Tommy and Gary stand over the woman who's not moving. Jesus Christ, Gary says. I thought she was supposed to be gone, Tommy accuses him. I thought the place was supposed to be empty. Shut up. But this is invented too. A scene she doesn't want to watch yet is drawn to over and over. They could be saying anything to each other or nothing, stunned by their own violence and bad luck. It's like watching a nightmare, the rising helplessness before the disaster she knows is going to happen. It's already happened. The two of them grab the state's evidence they've come to steal, the dead woman's dead husband's guns, 
a beautiful pair of his and hers Ithaca 10 gauges, a vintage Colt Buffalo gun, a brace of muzzle loaders. Gary has his hockey bag and the old towels to friction tape around the barrels. They go ahead as if the plan is working. At some point, they'll have to stop and talk about the body, but not yet. A draft snakes through the room, and the flame wavers, dangerous. It's nearly two, and she has to get up at six to be at work. It's supposed to snow tomorrow. She needs to leave time for the drive. She's been tired lately, nodding off over her circuit boards, the magnifying lens making her eyes go weird, the hot solder gagging her. She's been good, not smoking for the baby, drinking only Sanka. When she gets her leave, she'll make breakfast for Tommy in her bathrobe, kiss him goodbye, then crawl back in bed again, the morning sun warming the room. By this time, the call has come in on the truck. A neighbor on Blodgett marked it driving by with its lights off, dark figures walking out of the trees. A car from the sheriff's department is gliding cross county to investigate the complaint. Code 2, silent approach. It's a slow night, and the roads are empty, the traffic signals clunking unseen. The deputy slides through a red light. The bridge over the east branch is slippery. Gary's decided they have to burn the house down, and starts by lighting the drapes. The sheer fabric flashes, taking a snapshot of the body on the floor. Tommy can't stop him, and joins in. There's kerosene in the garage. The fingerprints are his. She won't try to deny it. But she knows him, too. She can't picture him sloshing the can around the house out of desperation, the carpet wet underfoot, fire leaping onto furniture, climbing the walls. She's imagined it happening to her, traded places with the old lady a thousand times. She could be the one picked up and repositioned under the covers, the one whose pillow burns, whose eyelashes curl. Instead, she sleeps by candlelight, sleeps deeply now, plowing the hours toward dawn, work, the cold car again, scraping snow off the windshield while the tailpipe chuffs out clouds. The windows are glowing when the deputy pulls up, the house pulsating like a spaceship about to take off. He blocks the road with his fury, and radios dispatch to send the fire department and the nearest backup, the night supervisor, who reads the situation and calls in the state police. Inside, Tommy and Gary see the car and understand they're fucked. The only thing to do now is slip out the back and get across the creek. It makes sense for Gary. It's not his truck. But why does Tommy run? Because he does. Down the steps of the back deck and across the sloping lawn, the crust crunching underfoot, two sets of prints headed into the woods, easy to follow as a trail of breadcrumbs in a fairy tale. They splash through the freezing creek, their boots filling, squishing as they scramble up the long, contoured hillside, slipping, falling, and going on, not knowing another car is shuddering down the farm road right for them. Its lights crest the hill and blind them, and then a spotlight in their eyes. If she dreams anything in these last minutes, she doesn't remember it, and she's tempted to see this as further proof that she's a fool, no hints or intuitions, just completely clueless. Where did she think the money for the truck came from? They're handcuffed and shoved, shoved into different cars, driven the silent miles to the public safety building in Owego, fingerprinted and interrogated separately, both of them standing on their Miranda rights. Each is allowed one five-minute phone call. The fire is pretty much out now. The Halsey Valley volunteers stand around the yard, dousing a pile of melted vinyl siding. In the bedroom, the county coroner leans over the old lady who rests on the smoking coils of the box spring, her arms curled in front of her face as if to protect herself. In these last minutes, Patty wonders, would she tell herself to run, take whatever money's in the house, throw her clothes in the car and just drive? Would it even matter? Because what happens next is inevitable. Uh, I have a, a friend who says I start every book with someone driving a car, and I think it's absolutely true. I just I don't know why. I have no idea why. And and she said you did it again with this book. I'm like no no she's in bed. And she goes look look at the front she's in the car. It's like oh, not again. So, uh, the first section arrested basically uh, starts when she hears that phone ring, and it ends at the end of that very very long night. And this is the last little section from Arrested. It's called Easy. 
And the Eileen here is her younger sister who has had her share of scrapes with the law in the small town they live in. She talks with the public defender's office, then makes a second trip to the jail. He takes it better than she expected, and she understands that she's let him down. The sun is setting over the hills as Eileen drives her home. Patty's glad to see it go, and at the same time worries about him spending the night there by himself. The day is finally over, but the feeling that she's forgotten something nags at her. Eileen makes dinner, their mother's chicken casserole with a Swiss cheese and box stuffing mix. It smells good, but they've both been awake too long. They're shaky from running on raw nerves, and neither of them feels like eating. Patty rakes hers over her plate, wondering what Tommy's having. She's supposed to drink milk for the baby and gags a glass down, tipping her chin up to help her swallow. What she could really use is a double shot of Jack to punch her into a different frame of mind, but that's at least three months away. She takes her vitamin at the sink and starts to do the dishes. I'll get those, Eileen says. I've got to do something, otherwise I'll go nuts. So Eileen dries, squatting and craning to fit the pots and plates into the cupboards. They don't dare watch TV, and the stereo's a trap, all the songs that belong to him. Eileen votes for gin, and Patty gives in to her. They sit tailor seat on the couch, facing each other, wrapped in sleeping bags, a supply of soft Dutch chocolate cookies within reach. It's like a slumber party, Patty says, except there's not popcorn all over the floor. Yeah, and Mom's not screaming at us. They pick up and discard from a pillow set between them. That was stupid, Eileen tells herself when Patty nabs the queen she just dumped. They don't keep score, but it seems to Patty that Eileen wins almost every hand. She wonders if it's too early to go to bed. Eileen wins again. It's just not my day, Patty says, and they quit. She finds the jokers and folds the flaps closed. You going to be okay out here? You can watch TV if you want. It won't bother me. Eileen's fine. Thank you, Patty says, and leans down to kiss her forehead the way she did when she used to babysit her. Now Eileen's taking care of her. It's like they've changed places. Like always, their mother and Shannon are nowhere. She brushes her teeth and pees, the bathroom all hers, unnatural. Dropping her clothes in the hamper, she sees one of his tube socks under yesterday's jeans, the butterscotch dye of his work boots worn into the heel. For an instant, she's tempted to rescue it, but doesn't. She circles the bed and gets in, her skin absorbing the chill of the sheets. She's too tired to read, and the book seems stupid now. Bad luck. She'll give it back to Eileen. She settles in, then decides it's too cold and levers herself out again, gropes the three steps to his dresser, and hauls on his favorite Bill's T-shirt and a pair of wool socks. They don't help right away. She just has to stay still and let the bed warm, like an engine. All day she's wanted to crawl under the covers and surrender. Now, with the house fallen silent around her, it doesn't feel like an escape. She rolls over and curls around the body pillow. She's seen the beds they have in jail on TV, steel bunked with thin mattresses and scratchy blankets. She's afraid he'll be cold. He needs two pillows. Sometimes when he doesn't sleep right, his neck hurts, and she has to rub heat into his muscles. She feels herself concentrating, focusing her closed eyes as if he can see his cell. She needs to relax and see nothing, an empty screen. She thinks of Casey, floating warm inside her, his heartbeat slowing, echoing hers. Sometimes at night, she feels him flutter or turn, a dolphin swimming. But right now, he's quiet. He's probably as tired as she is. Outside, a car motors by, a jet-like rush of wind, then nothing. The bed warms, and she drifts into a pleasant half-sleep, a dream of summer on her grandmother's farm when she was eleven, the old metal seat of the tractor, the barn that smelled of musty hay and cow dung. She's happy there, peeking over the rough boards of the stalls. The cows look up at her with milky eyeballs, but don't stop chewing. Their gums are a mix of pink and black like a dog's. When the phone goes off, it's like a memory, the ring calling her back to the present. Immediately, she knows it's about him. Someone from the jail. It's past midnight, the time reserved for bad news. She slaps at the phone, grips it. A man asks if this is Mrs. Dickerson. Older, serious, official. Yes, she says, this is she. Mrs. Dickerson, he says calmly. Do you know how easy it would be to kill you right now? And I'll leave you with uh, one very last, very small piece. 
Um, as the book progresses, we go through the trial and then his incarceration and finally the parole hearing. Uh, but this is still very early on, and she's dealing with the whole legal system. Um, it's the state of New York, and I had a lot of help putting this together from um, convicts' wives, judges, uh, lawyers, people that work inside the prisons. And so I sort of walk the reader through what it would really be like to have to deal with the system um, if you were in Patty's shoes here. Good old realism. Whatever happened to it? Um, and this little tiny section is called Good News. It's a new year, but it doesn't feel like one. The numbers look strange on the sign-in sheet, as if she's been transported to the future. The grand jury meets, and nothing happens for a week. The DA's people have to draft the indictment, the lawyer explains over the phone. If they indict him, Patty corrects him. I'm actually glad they want the manslaughter. It means they're prepared to get the lessers and hope the judge maxes them out at sentencing. I thought we didn't want the manslaughter, Patty asks. I'd rather have that than assault one. Combine that with the burglary one and we're looking at a minimum of eight years. Holding the phone, Patty wonders if he says shit like this to scare her. She clearly remembers him saying they didn't want the manslaughter. It backs up the murder charge if the jury's not completely sure. What about the arson? She asks. They'll probably get that. It sounds like they're getting everything they're asking for. Is that right? We won't know till the indictment comes back, but that's usually how it goes. I don't see why they even have a grand jury if that's how it works. I understand how it can seem that way, but you have to remember, it's just an intermediary step. It doesn't prove or disprove a thing, and it lets us see what the DA is thinking. That's the most important result of the grand jury, and we've got that. We can see he thinks his case is weak. I think that's good news. Murder 2, minimum, is 15 to life. Patty can't see how any of this is good, but doesn't argue. She knows by now that half of what he says is bullshit. He says things not for what they really mean, but like moves in a game, strategy that she has to guess at. Right now, he's probably just softening her up so she won't freak out when the grand jury returns the indictment. The next time he calls, two days later, he has news. The court clerk has sent him notice. The indictment's officially in. Okay, she says. Now remember what I said the other day, he says. And she thinks, you fucker, you fucking bastard. That's all I've got for you there. So, thank you. Thanks very much. Um, it's, it's a quiet book, I think, a, a rather calm book. Um, it's not the sort of the, the big clash. There's not a lot of laughs. Um, I want to think it's a book about longing and, in a strange way, romance. And the fact that she sees the only way to live is to stand by him. Um, through all these years. And she worries about how she acts and how strong she can be for him, in a way. Um, it's a rather strange book in that way, I think, and, and claustrophobic. Um, the biggest difficulty I had in putting it together was dealing with a simple amount of time. How do you cover, say, 35 years um, in the present tense? Very, very difficult, I find. Uh, summary narration in the present tense is very, very hard to do. And so I had to look around for people that had actually tried to do it, people like James Salter uh, or William Maxwell, uh, Virginia Woolf. Um, and so I looked to their sort of more quiet examples there. Any questions at all about uh, this book or, or the other book that came out uh, last year, Faithful, with Stephen King about the Red Sox? It's a, another, another little book that I contributed to. Well, there are three sisters, and, and my wife uh, comes from a family with three sisters. And I've always wanted to write a book about three sisters and, and how they become um, both very supportive for each other, but also very competitive, and how they are always looking to be the good sister in the eyes of their mother there. And I knew that, that Patty would have what I like to call close allies, and also um, there, there are a few enemies, I think, in the book, certainly Donna who was a friend, turns into an enemy in the book. Uh, but I wanted one sister to really be there for her and the other sister not quite to be there, but always tantalizing. The one that she would always want a little more help, a little more support from, but never quite gets. 
there. Eileen would do anything for Patty, and does. Uh, whereas Shannon seems to be offering to help, but never really stands by her side there. So in, in the case where you have fallen onto hard times and bad luck, you always wonder who is going to come to my side? Who is, who is going to stand by me and help me through this? And, and Patty certainly finds out who those people are. Unlikely, some of them. Psy, this unlikely guy, stands by her. Did you go to the premier of Fever Pitch last night? <laughs> <laughs> and if so, what did you think of it? Uh, well, yes, yes, I went to the premiere, and um, that's why I have the bags under my eyes. Um, I was out till about 6 a.m. Um, it, it, it was a fine time. It was a fine, fine time. Uh, people from Rhode Island certainly know how to drink. I've <laughs> got to tell you that. Um, um, the movie, uh, uh, Jimmy Fallon is very cute and very vulnerable, and Drew Barrymore is Drew Barrymore. She's, she's always good that way. And the Fairley Brothers, you know, they get in a few of their strange sort of quirky lines there. But they didn't write the film. Um, it was written by um, Lowell Gans and Babalu Mandel, who do all sorts of other very inside-the-box Hollywood romantic comedies. And so I don't, I don't think the Farrelly's could overcome the screenplay, sadly enough. I like it when they direct their own stuff, even though it's sometimes very juvenile and, and trashy. <laughs> I, I, I give them credit for not, well, this is sad, but I give them credit for not looking away from the very low joke. You know, it's, it's the same sort of credit I used to give Monty Python, but Monty Python could do the high joke and the low joke. You know? The Farrelly's kind of do the middle and the low. So, <laughs> sometimes that's good enough. Comedy is hard. It's very hard. You know? Um, it, this is, I think, my, my fifth or sixth book from the female point of view. I'm actually more comfortable writing from the female point of view. I grew up in a family of women. I'm in my own family now. I'm surrounded by women. And um, they will always you know, step on my feet and hands when I get something wrong. And, and they are my first readers, uh, my family. And they will always sort of just hack and hack at it. In fact, my, my best readers outside of my family are also uh, women novelists. Um, so I have a bit of a comfort zone. But I think with any character that you live with for a long time, you have to find some sort of comfortable place to be, to, to really inhabit them. And that, to me, is the real, the real excitement of, for me for writing, is being in that other person's skin and having to, to take on that other life and to really think realistically about what that life entails, how they live day to day, how they get through the days, um, simple things like that. And that's why I like going back to almost what people nowadays would call a sort of a plodding realism. Um, people go to work, they come home, they watch TV. You know, uh, All the sort of you know, bells and whistles and fireworks writers out there right now don't want to deal with that. But that's still the way we live, sadly, I guess. For, for good or worse, that is the way we live. And, and I, I wanted to sort of pay tribute to that in this book. Um, the, the, the difficult thing about writing this book in terms of reaching that other character was not writing from a woman's point of view or from the small town point of view, which I'm not from a small town, um, but dealing with the world of families of incarcerated people. I and mean, it's, it's a very specialized world that's set off to the side. It's, it's a group of people we don't really think about very much. And when I first, my first inkling that I was going to write this book was about three, three and a half years ago, I began to read a lot of books dealing with prison. And I, I didn't know why I was reading these books. I was simply drawn to them. But they would always describe prison life and life inside the walls. And for every person inside the walls, there are many people waiting for them outside the walls. And I, I said, that's the story that hasn't been told. I mean, we've, we've got mini-series and HBO you know, series on what prison life is or could be like. Uh, but hardly anything about the people waiting outside. And that seemed to me a much bigger story. And it, I thought also of uh, Ha Jin's book, Waiting, and the promise of that book. Um, and I, I thought, if I could take the promise of that book and look at what it's like to spend these years waiting and what it entails and how you change across this time. Because when Patty, you know, when Patty first has to deal with things, she's about 27. And at the end of the book, she's in her late 50s. And she's gone through this entire metamorphosis um, I thought that would be a very interesting story if I could get it, if I could get it right, if I could understand it. And so I began talking with people with the Osborne Association, which supports 
uh, families, people in prison. And it just so happened, I called them up and I talked to a woman. I was very naive. I was just like stepping on toes everywhere. I was like, you know, I'd, I'd really like to talk to someone who's in this position. I was like, you know, what a presumption. And she said, well, my husband's in prison for life. And she said, I, I will talk with you. Because she didn't want me to just run around the way that I usually do and just slam into things and, and screw up. Um, and so in this case, I did most of my research even before I sat down to write the book, which I think is definitely the way to do it. I've written other books where I sort of like just bowled forth and you know, got the pages down and then went back to fix things and very, very difficult to do. But in this case, they sort of held my hand and took me through what it's like. Um, and that's what I wanted to get across to the reader. What is it really like to be this person in this situation? Um, and we'll, we'll see. I, I sent the galleys to the, the people that helped me, and they said, "I'm amazed what you got." And it's it's merely because it's what they told me. You know, I just found a way to somehow dramatize it. And also, I mean, the, there was also a, a temptation to dramatize it too much. You know, to to go over the top with it. And I, I definitely wanted it to be a quiet book, so I didn't split the narration between you know, Patty and Tommy. It was just going to be Patty. It's her view from the outside in. You got something? Yeah, I'm curious. In the first question of this book, did you ever go inside the prison? No. No. I didn't want to do that. For, for some reason, I felt that I had to stay outside the whole time. No. You need to go inside the prison. <laughs> I think it's very serious for life. But when I was a youngster, um, one Sunday afternoon after friend's home for dinner, and uh, George his father said, hey, fellas, the men's club is going out to visit the new prison in Walpole. You guys want to come along? And George and I looked at him and said, oh, what a lot. This is going to be a hoot. And we went. And it was a wonderful ride out there, and I never decided to walk in, and there was a uh, this sort of door that was drawn up on a huge chain, you know, almost like the, a motor car. And we walked inside this area, and we heard that the uh, uh, chains bring the door down, and the man came up from the top and looked down at us, and then more chains, <laughs> and the door opened up on the other side, and we were in the prison. And I had never in my life been in a place where I could go out and get the tea and go where I wanted to go. But suddenly, I couldn't do that, even though I was simply a guest in this place. And we went around, and we actually did the privilege, we went to the cells, you know, we saw the, we saw the death chamber. Um, and it is a unique psychological experience. I would say it's impossible to write a book about this without subjecting yourself to that, to have some concept of what the psychological situation you're ready to go, right? Yeah, and I, I think that experience is shared by, you know, literally thousands and thousands of people that have not been sentenced to prison there. But the, the people that I, I worked with in terms of talking about prison were not people that were incarcerated, but the women who visited. And what it's like to be a woman visiting a loved one, and especially a husband or a boyfriend, and visiting with children, which is a whole different, a whole different thing. And also the conjugal visit or the trailer visit in New York State, um, which is a complete thing of its own. And to learn about that, me going to the prison wouldn't have done anything. Um, it, it had to be through her eyes and her experience. Um, and the way that she sees the world and the way that I see the world as, you know, writer looking for research results would be completely, completely different there. So I relied on my first person sources. I think there's, for whether it's journalism uh, or whether it's fiction, I think there's, there's nothing more rewarding than talking to someone who has gone through that experience and lived it and, in some cases, is living it month by month, year by year still there. Because 
their emotions and their take on things is going to have so much more than mine ever could because I don't come from that at all. Yeah. Well, I, I've, I've, I've been to... I don't mean from the outside. I have been actually going inside. Yes, yes, yes. Well, I, I've been in, you know... Other places, I haven't been in Auburn, I haven't been in, uh, was it Bear Hill? I haven't been to the, the medium security. I don't even know if you can get into some of them. Now, they have, they have weird visiting rules in New York. Very weird. Some mediums allow conjugal visits or touch visits, some don't. And it just depends on where you get sent. It's a very odd system and, um, what's the word for it? It's, it's capricious. It just, it does whatever it wants to with these people and there's, there's really no repercussions. Um, it's, it's strange. And to be caught up in that, as these women are, it's, it's a very difficult situation, you think? Um, I thought that the passages you read were anything but boring. But I'm wondering... Well, thank you. I, I tried. <laughs> how do you react when your wife tells you that you wrote, you've written a boring book? <laughs> well, I, like I said, I, mean, I know that in the cases of some of these books, I'm willing to lose the readers to get down what I really want, you know. And it, it, it freaked my editors out, too. My editors don't like this book. Um, they really did not like this book. They didn't want to publish the book um, because it, it's not a conventional book. It doesn't feed off conflict. It's not wacky and ironic and irreverent. Um, it's very plain and earnest and, I hope, heartfelt, which, while it, not in vogue at all right now in, in the literary circles, I think is what this particular character in this particular situation called for. I think this was the very best treatment that I could give to this material to bring out the emotion and the story that's there fully. Um, and if, if, if they don't like that, you know, that's, you know, it, it's, it's their dime, so yeah, they can say that. But it doesn't mean I'm going to change my approach to the, the subject matter. And I've written goofy and wacky and ironic and crazy and kooky and firework type books. It matters what subject you're dealing with or what character, really, you're dealing with. Does it fit that character? Is it appropriate for that character? Will it bring everything that's in there across? And you have to find, I think, that unique voice and tense and structure and form and container and organization. You need to find whatever it is that is going to bring that across and bring everything out. And if you don't do that, then the book doesn't work. Or the book may work, but it's not, it doesn't dig as deep as it could or should go, I think. Uh, I just want to say, as somebody who goes into prison a fair amount, I help prisoners, I, I do uh, post-conviction and do appeals. So most of the people I'm working for uh, are serving long sentences, sometimes life sentences, usually more than 10 years. And uh, I just, I'm just very glad I came to hear that somebody's dealing with this subject. Because the people who hire me tend to be the people outside, the people you're writing about. And uh, prisons are, are perfectly ordinary places. That's the fascinating thing about them. After you visit them a few times, you, you come to see how a prison life is filled with these very mundane uh, things. Uh, what do the prisoners do? What the rules of the house are? What the privileges are? So this consumes all the time. That and working on, their, on getting out of some kind of post condition And the most difficult thing for me to understand is the relationship between the family on the outside and the people on the inside. Because they just stand by. Uh, you know, mothers, grandmothers, uh, tends to be the fathers. And if you were to go to any of these visits, uh, they would look like perfectly ordinary uh, family visits. There's really nothing remarkable about them, except the people look a little bit sad. And so, it's, considering that we have too many people in prison, in any given day in America, that means to me at least that there are several million more outside who live lives like the ones you're describing. Well, I think it's, it's thank you. It's, it's, a, it's a very common and very shared story out there. Um, and the danger, another danger in writing it is that you make it the generic story, you know, and, and you have to do everything you can to make this particular to this one woman, this one woman named Patty. And that was the hardest thing to get into that character. And then everything else sort of came in, in talking to the women, um, the women that go, you know, every weekend, every weekend, every weekend. I mean, in some neighborhoods, I can taste in North Philadelphia where it's uh, simply the day that most people have some of these things on. Yeah. And 
And, and also say, I mean, the classic uh, New York Times magazine story is the women on the bus. The women on the bus from the Bronx or Brooklyn. And they, they run that story maybe every four or five years. And a journalist will come out of that experience and write that book about the woman visiting by bus. You know, and you'll have a big book you know, on that relationship every five or six years. Um, but to me, it just doesn't get into the skin of everyday life because every day is not visiting day. You know, there is the rest of life. And, and as, as he's serving his time, she's you know, living her life on the outside, and, and they can change and grow in any kind of different directions. And that's what seemed fascinating to me is that the way that she changes and how she changes in her view of him, both inside and when he comes out later there. Because it is, weirdly enough, a happy ending. She, he does come out, and they are together even though things have completely changed. Well, thank you. I guess I love the fact that she wrote from a woman's perspective, and it just felt so very real. Well, thanks. I just wanted to say, if you and your wife play bridge, then the penitentiary inmates play fabulous bridge. <laughs> interesting, interesting. Well, thank you, thank you. I mean, the, the writing in, I think, in anyone's point of view, any fictional point of view, is going to be difficult, and it will work for some people, and it, it won't work for other people. And when you take on, when you appropriate someone else's story that way, I, I think it's your responsibility to do your very best to get it right. And if you fall short, you fall short, but you have to listen, I think, to what that person's saying. And also, uh, for me at least, to look at what has been written in that vein already and to see what, say, the cliches of that story are and whether you can overcome them or spin them or you know, cut the knees out from under them. Um, so you, you try to verse yourself in that material. Um, I, I wrote a, a, a semi-successful, semi semi-unsuccessful novel a few years ago from an African-American point of view, about an African-American neighborhood. And, you know, I, I looked hard at the, at the genre and what it was doing and what it could do, and I tried to do my best, but I think ultimately I failed in it. Um, but when a character comes to you and you see the story there, I, I think it's your responsibility to do your very best to get it out, not just to say, oh, I can't write that. I just can't do it, you know, because I'm not the right person. I'm not in the right place. I don't, I don't have the right tools, blah, blah, blah. I mean, as, as a writer, especially as a literary writer, you have to, I, I think, you should be able to try to take on anyone's story. Um, as long as you do the legwork and, and do your very best to do it. How much of the book would you describe as fictional in the most imaginative sense? How much of it is a interpretation of your interviews with people? I'd say it's probably about 50 50. Uh, because I know that the general public coming to the book are going to have what I call a non fiction interest. They want to find out what it's really like. Um, that's part of what makes this woman's life interesting is because it's taking the reader to a place that they will never have to go, most of them. Um, so it's probably about 50-50, I think. In the end, it's all fiction, of course, because you have to make the right choices of the, of the ton of research that you get. You have to, to pick and choose and select just the very best stuff and then fit it in there right so it doesn't feel like, OK, here comes the research. You know, you've, you've all read, you know, costume dramas from, you know, the 17th or 18th century where all of a sudden here's all this stuff, you know. Um, so you try to sort of blend it in and weave it in as best you can so it doesn't feel like research there. Part of this is also having an interesting point of view character. Patty, because she knows nothing about the system going in, naturally has to learn the system. So her learning becomes both my learning and the reader's learning about the system. So it's a natural way in there. Which is one reason why I didn't want to do it ironically, you know, and saying, oh, ho, aren't we the smart readers? We know everything, and Patty knows nothing. Boy, is she going to have a surprise later. Um, no, we're going to learn the way that she learns, because the legal system is, you know, it is, it is you know, this, this weird labyrinth that unless you're very, very close to it, you have no idea how it works. Um, it, actually, it, it just came to mind that she was pregnant. 
there. She seemed like a young woman on the verge of fulfilling what she thinks is a marvelous life, and that is um, having a husband and starting a family and having a place to live in this small town that she considers her home. Her, her world seems ideal. Um, to Patty, even though a lot of people will think that she doesn't have much, at that point she seems to have everything. I mean, everything that she wants is right there. Um, and like that, in, in a way, all of it is taken away. But I also wanted to talk about the relationship between, um, uh, well, in this case, Casey, his relationship both with uh, his father, Tommy, in prison, and how he grows up basically without a father, um, even though the father is present on every visiting day, and Patty does her best to, to include him. It, it makes her job that much harder as a mother. Um, and so his relation, Casey's relationship is strained both with Tommy and with Patty, um, and is a bit of a heartache. Um, Casey's a really interesting character. I think there's probably a novel in Casey. Um, he's, he's just a very interesting, interesting person, I think. But he's just, so now when I think of him, since the book's already done, he's just sort of out there. You know, he's out there living out in New Mexico and working out there. But, yeah, and why a small town? Probably not, so it wouldn't be that, that typical Bronx slash Brooklyn, you know, woman on the bus novel. Um, again, a, a place that I don't think a lot of novelists have really looked at yet. You know, when you see a story that you think is really big and you say, oh my God, no one's, no one's really looked at this yet, you know, you get excited and you immediately just say, okay, I'm going to do everything I can. Well, first, I'm sure that I've dreamed about these characters, not just when I was writing the book, but after I was done with the book. Um, I think about, like Casey, I think about them a lot as if they are real people, which I know it's just a trick that I sort of play on myself, um, because you spend so much time trying to make these people real to other people that you sort of have to see them as real, especially when you're working, in this case, as I am, with realism. Um, and the second question about the guilt, whether Patty thinks Tommy is guilty, yes, it means a great, great deal. It means a great deal because how she sees Tommy at the beginning has been under assault. As soon as she finds out he's been arrested for this crime, the doubts begin to sort of hammer away, you know, how well do I know this person? Um, because I am, in a way, sacrificing a great part of my life to stand by them, but strangely, as she goes through the process of standing by him, that is sort of held off to the side. It may nag at her here and there. Um, and later on in the book, there's, there's a passage in which, um, well, well I, I don't want to give that away, but um, the, the question of his guilt is, is always being sort of, it's, it's being addressed in a very nagging fashion and always being held at bay, but it's always there. It's definitely always there. And she, in this case, she's got Gary to blame. Uh, because she always thinks Gary is the ringleader, Gary, you know, is the thief, Gary is the person that caused all this, and Tommy just sort of went along with it, um, which is you know, how a lot of people react, especially in, in a crime that involves, say, two or three people. I mean, we've seen people getting death sentences for being in the car outside when someone gets shot in the liquor store. Um, the, the law is very, very strange. Uh, any more? One more question? Anything? Yes. I find the book very contrasting. As you said, it's a very light book, but I think there's a lot of emotional turmoil. It's a pattern, very quiet. And, uh, I 
as you were writing this book, were you considering a that this book into the screenplay? I had a very strong sense when I read the first paragraph. Everything became very vivid. Everything was moving. So that's the sense um, I got. It would be very interesting. Also, on the raising of social uh, awareness, I a very good point. These are the forgotten people. I think most of us sitting here are living <coughs> on a certain level of, uh, I should say, income level in society. Normally, these people probably were not thinking to encounter, or if we see them, we're so, we don't want to. And, and yet there are millions of people yes, out there in this particular situation. Yeah. Well, the question is that um, even though it is a very quiet book, there seems to be a lot of uh, turmoil, emotional turmoil underneath it because of what's going on. And had I ever thought of it in terms of, say, a screenplay and having, say, a movie that, that brings this situation into a, you know, the greater light because people don't think about it that much. Um, because, as you say, the beginning is very cinematic. Um, not really, I didn't think. I thought of this book as uh, a very interiorized book. It's a book of what's going on so inside of Patty all the time. It's that, that inner weather there. Um, there aren't many great conflict scenes. And the way the time is spaced out, I don't see it as something that, say, has, you know, Here's your typical climax, and here's a little lull, and here's a climax, and there's a lull, there's another climax, and a climax. Um, I don't know how you'd do it in film. I, I really don't know. Um, and no one has approached me in terms of, you know, quick, give me those film rights. You got Spielberg on the phone. Come on. Is, you know, but, but, yeah, I think it is a very, um, a very emotional book, even though the surface is sometimes very, very flat in a way, especially in the middle sections. Oh, well, the, the, uh, in writing classes, they always tell you, you know, never do one-person scenes. Never do one-person scenes, because all that can happen is someone looking out a window. And that's what, the, that's what the cover is, someone looking out a window. I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Um, and, and this book is basically one-person scene after one-person scene after one-person scene. It's Patty driving. It's Patty behind the counter at the liquor store. It's, you know, it's Patty working in the kitchen. It's Patty driving up. Again, it's, um, which is one reason I think why the editors didn't like it. <laughs> but um, but I, I, I think Patty's fascinating, obviously. I, mean, I spent a lot of time with her, um, and I spent you know, many more pages than made this book with her. Um, but a film, I don't know, it, it would end up being that, that old Juliette Binoche French film where we look at Juliette Binoche's face for like, a minute and a half, and we say, "Okay, there's sadness." Like, I don't know how you'd do it. I really. Well, the the flip side is you'd hate to get it tarted up. You'd hate to get it cheesed and faked the way that Hollywood can do it. I mean, imagine somebody like Spielberg coming in and doing it, or Michael Mann, or you know, one of these wonderful directors. Um, it, it would take a very special person to do it, I think. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you all very much for coming out. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you very much.